So there are many beautiful strands in the story of math and physics. Two of the most fruitful, one, fruitful ones involve knot theory and mirror symmetry. And in this talk, I'll describe a new connection between the two. We'll find a solution to a central problem in knot theory called a knot categorification problem as a new application of mirror symmetry. So knot theory is an area of mathematics born, born out of 19th century physics. The first known link invariant, the Gauss linking number, um, is an invariant of a link with uh, two knot components. It was um, discovered by Gauss in the course of his study of electromagnetism. So a link invariant um, has the property that links with different invariants um, cannot be smoothly deformed into each other, so it can be used to tell links apart. Maxwell uh, apparently found a Gauss linking number independently from Gauss, and uh, he noted um, here that it's not a very good invariant. <laughs> so in 84, Vaughan Jones discovered a polynomial link invariant depending on one variable. The Jones polynomial is defined by uh, picking a, um, a planar projection of the knot and a skein relation that satisfies as you untie the knot. So to get the Jones polynomial, you want to take n to be 2. It turned out that um, other values of n also lead to knot invariants. So in particular, if you take uh, n is equal to 0, you get the Alexander polynomial, which is um, the first known polynomial knot invariant um, dating to uh, 1923. Von Joseph was the second. Uh, the proper framework for these knot invariants was found by uh, Witten in 89. He showed that they originate from quantum field theory, uh, transcendence theory. Like electromagnetism and QCD, Transimon's gauge theory is written in terms of a vector potential valued in a Lie algebra, G. And, but unlike the more familiar gauge theories, to write down the action, you do not need the metric on the underlying three-manifold. The action is given in terms of Transimon's three-form, so hence the name. Because the action doesn't depend on the metric, the path integral is invariant under all deformation of the three-manifold, so it computes topological invariance you uh, get to introduce um, heavy uh, charged particles um, external to the theory um, in the usual way by um, inserting uh, into the path integral the following quantity um, where, uh, whoops, where uh, for if you have a particle of, of in, uh, charged under some representation V of the, um, of the Lie algebra, this preserves um, topological invariance, so um, uh, it also, because it also doesn't require introducing the metric. So Transheimer's path integral on a three-manifold, together with um, external charged particle, or several of them, um, give topological invariance of the three-manifold together with knots and links. If you're only interested in, var in invariance of knots, you could take uh, the three-manifold to be simply R3. Uh, Witten showed that Transheimer's theory is solvable exactly. This is rare for non-trivial quantum field theory. In particular, he showed that Jones polynomial comes from Transheimer's theory based on uh, Lie algebra SU2 with knots colored by its fundamental two-dimensional representation. And this placed the Jones polynomial in the more general framework that you get by considering Transheimer's theory based on different Lie algebras and picking different representations. In particular, you get the Alexander polynomial from the same setting by taking uh, the Lie algebra to be the Lie superalgebra, GL1 slash 1. Transheimer's link invariants are known as quantum group invariants. Their reformulation in terms of quantum groups uh, was given by Rishitikin and Turaev in 89, a year after Witten's work. Quantum uh, this quantum group symmetry isn't manifest in the theory classically um, as a symmetry of its action. So rather, it's a quantum symmetry of Transheimer's theory. Today, in fact, many works on knot invariants start with quantum groups and not with Transheimer's theory. For our talk today, it will be crucial to recall how quantum groups came into the story. Transheimer's theory associates to a Riemann surface with punctures a vector space, which is its Hilbert space. The punctures are positions of heavy charged particles at one instant at a time, so they're colored by representations of the Lie algebra. Transheimer's theory is solvable thanks in part to the fact that its Hilbert space uh, turns out to be a finite dimensional vector space. Witten showed that the Hilbert space of Transheimer's theory is spanned by vectors that have a name. Uh, they're known as conformal blocks of the affine Lie algebra um, associated to G at level um, K, related to the level of Transheimer's theory. 
conformal blocks um, of the affine Lie algebra on the Riemann surface, they come from two-dimensional conformal field theory with affine Lie algebra symmetry. Now, for our talk, it suffices to know that every such conformal block, and hence every state in the Hilbert space, can be produced explicitly as a solution to a very famous linear differential equation. The equation that conformal blocks solve was discovered by Knizhnik and Zemlodikov in 84 in the course of studying conformal field theory. Uh, the variables in this equation are positions of punctures on the Riemann surface. Now, in a topological theory such as Schoen-Simons theory, time evolution acts uh, trivially in the Hilbert space. Um, evolution in any time is equivalent to evolution in zero time. Um, to get something interesting, you want to let the positions of punctures vary with time. And then the path interval computes an invariant of the colored braid in the Riemann surface times time. The braid invariant um, is a matrix acting on the space of conformal blocks. That braiding matrix describes analytic continuation of the space of solutions um, to the Knizhnik's homological equation along the path corresponding to the braid. Now, in general, such monotony problems are very hard. For the uh, Casey equation, the monotony problem was famously solved uh, in 89 by Drinfeld and by uh, Karzan and Lustig, uh, following works by physicists. Uh, they show that monodromy matrix is a product of R matrices of the UQ quantum group corresponding to G. Um, each R matrix acts by exchanging a neighboring pair of punctures. So in this way, transhymous theory leads to invariance of braid isotopy based on the quantum group. You can represent any link as a closure of some braid. The path integral of transhymous theory together with a link computes a very specific uh, braiding matrix element. That element uh, is the one that's uh, picked out by the states in the Hilbert space uh, corresponding to a collection of uh, caps and cups. This pointer moves very slowly. <laughs> it's not really falling my hand. Um, so the states in the Hilbert space that you need for that are some very special solutions of the Casey equation. Um, the state containing a cap uh, describes a pair of punctures on the Riemann surface colored by complex conjugate representations that come together and fuse to disappear. As such, it's a special instance of fusion uh, where a pair of charged particles fuse to a single one. So both braiding and fusion in conformal field theory play an important role in getting uh, not invariance from transhymous theory. Today, transhymous theory and its not invariance play an important role in many subjects very far from the areas of math and physics uh, where it came from. In examples include uh, condensed matter physics, topological quantum computing, and biology. I'm sure you, people in this audience have heard talks on all this. Um, now, transhymous is not invariance um, turn out to always be Laurent polynomials with coefficients that are integers. This suggests that transhymous theory, or at least it's not invariance, may be shadows of a deeper, more fundamental theory. In 89, Kovanov showed that one can associate to every link a homology theory, which produces a collection of bigraded vector spaces whose Euler characteristic is the Jones polynomial. The integer coefficients of the Jones polynomial are signed counts of dimensions of not homology groups. So um, Kovanov's construction is a part of a larger program called the Categorification Program, pioneered by Crane and Igor Frankel. This program aims to lift um, vector, integers to vector spaces, vector spaces to categories, and maps between vector spaces to functors between categories. A simple toy example uh, of categorification comes from a Riemannian manifold M, whose homology groups categorify its Euler characteristic. The homology groups are constructed by uh, starting with a complex of vector spaces with boundary maps between them that compose to zero. Uh, the complex, um, obtained by triangulation of the manifold, has more information about the geometry than the Euler characteristic, or in fact, more than the homology groups. From a physics perspective, uh, the Euler characteristic is the partition function of supersymmetric quantum mechanics with um, the manifold M as a target space. The collection of vector spaces um, could be provided by Morse's approach to supersymmetric quantum mechanics as perturbative supersymmetric ground states, where um, indexed by the fermion number. The action of uh, the supercharge on this complex is generated by instantons, and Q um, 
defines a differential because as a supercharge, it squares to zero. Kovanov showed that one can um, assign to every link a complex of vector spaces that's graded by the Fermi number and one additional grading, such that the bi-graded homology groups categorify the Jones polynomial. And moreover, they are themselves link invariants. Now, Kovanov's remarkable categorification of the Jones polynomial is very explicit and easily calculable, although computational complexity grows exponentially with the number of crossings. In 2013, Webster showed that there is an um, abstract algebraic framework for categorification of link invariants of arbitrary uh, Lie algebra, which, however, in contrast to Kovanov's construction, is anything but explicit. Despite the successes of the program, one is missing a fundamental principle that explains why is categorification possible. Um, this construction really has no right to exist. Unlike in our toy example uh, of categorification of the Euler characteristic of a Riemannian manifold, Kovanov's construction and its generalizations do not come from either geometry or physics in any unified way. So the problem Kovanov initiated is to find a general framework for construction of link invariants that works uniformly for all Lie algebras, which explains what link homology groups are and why they exist. To categorify um, quantum knot invariants, one would like to associate to space of conformal blocks, you get at a fixed time slice, a bi-graded category, which in addition to the usual Fermi number grading has an additional grading associated to Q. To braid, you'd like to associate functors between categories corresponding to the top and the bottom. To links, you'd like to associate um, a vector space to whose elements are morphisms between objects of the categories at the top and at the bottom up to the action of the braiding functor. Moreover, you'd like to do all that in a way that recovers the quantum knot invariants upon decategorification when you take the trace. One typically proceeds by coming up with a category, and then you have to work to prove that decategorification gives the quantum knot invariants you set out to categorify. As I'll explain, we'll find two solutions to the knot categorification problem, a virtue of both of which will be that the second step is automatic. Mirror symmetry is a remarkable duality which originates from string theory. Mirror, mirror symmetry relates pairs of Calabi-Yau manifolds, which are vibrations by pairs of dual tori over a common base. Um, a theory of strings on a pair of dual tori has a symmetry that exchanges string uh, winding modes on one and momentum modes on the other. Um, the symmetry is why strings, uh, string theories based on distinct manifolds can be equivalent could never happen in a theory of point particles. calabi manifolds like X and Y always come in families. The family members are parameterized by choices of complex structure, which, which we'll call B-type, and symplectic or Kähler structure, which we'll call A-type, which modify the metric on the manifold. The B-type varies the shape of the manifold, while the A-type varies its size. Mirror symmetry changes X and Y while exchanging variations of B-type and A-type structures. This way, um, it exchanges problems in algebraic or B-type geometry and symplectic, A-type, together with exchanging X and Y. An example of such a correspondence involves counting rational curves, or more precisely holomorphic maps, to X, which is a calabi l threefold. This is an infinite series of difficult problems in uh, A-type geometry, one for each degree. In the mirror, you, um, it turns out one gets to reproduce all counts at once by computing periods of the top holomorphic three-form. Mirror symmetry is enriched um, by introducing brains supported in a submanifold. A brain is a boundary condition. Um, by including brains, one allows otherwise closed strings to have boundaries. Brains um, turned out to be key objects in string theory, and asking how mirror symmetry acts on them turned out to lead deep insights into mirror symmetry. One such insight uh, was due to Strominger, Yao, and Zaslow. Uh, they showed that in order for every point-like brain on X to have a mirror brain on Y, the mirror pairs of manifolds have to be fiber by dual tori, which is how we introduce mirror symmetry today, how we think about it today. Um, a spectacular insight on mirror symmetry was provided by Konsevich in his um, 94 ICM address. Um, one can regard brains on a calabi manifold as objects of a category whose morphisms are open strings stretched between brains. 
Concevich conjectured that the way to understand mirror symmetry is as an equivalence of pairs of categories of brains associated to X and Y, one of which comes from complex and the other from symplectic geometry. The category of brains that coming from complex geometry, um, whose objects are physicists call B-type brains, um, it's called by mathematicians the derived category of coherent sheaves, um, supported on, they are supported on complex uh, submanifolds of X. Um, the category of A brains coming from symplectic geometry is the derived Foucault cat category, um, whose objects, A brains, are supported on real or Lagrangian submanifolds. Conservative homological mirror symmetry is a conjecture that category of B brains on X is the same as, as equivalent to the category of A brains on Y. Mirror symmetry um, does naturally provides a supply of categories of geometric origin. And in an appropriate setting, they solve the not categorification problem. Moreover, for, for these categories, you always by construction know what it is that they categorify. In parallel to solving the not categorification problem, we'll um, discover a new family of mirror pairs connected to representation theory where homological mirror symmetry can be made um, as explicit as in the simplest known example. The Knizhik's homological equation, which plays a central role in knot theory, um, has a geometric counterpart. In the world of mirror symmetry, there is an equally fundamental differential equation, uh, which is sometimes called the quantum differential equation. Quantum differential equation is a linear differential equation for a vector valid function uh, over the moduli space of either symplectic or complex structures. The name quantum differential equation comes from symplectic geometry, where um, the coefficients of the equation are computed uh, by quantum multiplication with a, um, with a cohomology class. The quantum product on cohomology of x is defined by counting rational curves. The first term in quantum, in quantum multiplication is a classical product on the cohomology, and the subsequent, sub, subsequent terms are quantum corrections. Both the equation and its monodromy problem featured uh, prominently starting with essentially the very first papers in mirror symmetry. The solutions um, to the quantum differential equation live in a finite dimensional vector space associated to the manifold, which is spanned by charges of its brains. The solutions are obtained by um, counting holomorphic maps of all degrees from a domain curve, which is best thought of as an infinite cigar with a circle boundary at infinity. You get a specific solution of the equation by choosing a B-type brain as a boundary condition at infinity. The solution depends on the brain only through its charge, so, and not its shape. The Knizhik's homological equation um, not only has the same flavor as the quantum differential equation, under certain conditions, they coincide. On the knot theory side, um, you, it turns out you want to take the Riemann surface to be uh, an infinite punctured cylinder rather than a complex plane with punctures. Um, this is just as well, it enriches the theory, allowing it to describe invariants of knots um, in R2 times S1 and not just in R3. On the geometric side, you want to take the target manifold to be a very special color Biao one um, that's best described as the moduli space of um, singular G monopoles on R3. The transimus gauge group um, is related to uh, G, um, the monopole group, by Langlands or electric magnetic type duality. So in transimus theory, we view uh, knots in three dimensional space as paths of heavy particles electrically charged under LG. In the geometric description, the same heavy particle appear as Dirac monopole of the Langlands dual group. This magnetic description is what's needed to understand categorification, as was anticipated by um, in works of uh, Witten. The manifold um, X uh, has played an important role in mathematics before. In geometric Langlands, correspondence is known as a transversal slice to the affine Grassmannian of G. It's actually important in physics as well. In addition to being monopole moduli space, it's also a Coulomb branch of certain um, three-dimensional quiver gauge theories. Uh, the monopole moduli space is parameterized in part by positions of some number of smooth tooth polycup type monopoles on R3, whereas the positions of singular Dirac type monopoles are fixed, and they determine the metric. 
to get a KZ equation to coincide with a quantum differential equation, you want to place all the singular um, Dirac-type monopoles at the origin of a complex plane in R3. Then um, the rotations of this plane are an isometry of x. The parameter q of knot theory will be related to keeping track of charges of states under the symmetry that rotates this plane. The fact that quantum group invariants become interesting only uh, when q is not equal to 1 has a geometric counterpart. The monopole moduli space has more symmetries than a typical Calabi-Yau, so quantum multiplication differs from classical only uh, as long as q is not equal to 1. X is what's called a hypercalar as opposed to just um, calar. Um, the fact that uh, Kz equation um, of the affine Lie algebra um, has a geometric interpretation um, as the quantum differential equation is a recent theorem by Ivan Danilenko, who is um, doing his first postdoc at Berkeley. The positions of punctures on the Riemann surface turn out to coincide with A-type moduli of X. So it follows from that that the braid has a geometric interpretation as a path in the um, complexified Kähler modular, A-type moduli space, since um, it's these moduli that are the um, of X that correspond to relative positions of punctures on the Riemann surface. A central expectation in mirror symmetry is the fact that monodromy of the quantum differential equation is categorified by a, a functor acting on the category of brains, which transports the category along a path um, in Kähler moduli, which is an equivalence. Proving this uh, for a category of B brains is difficult in general. Um, in, setting rel in settings relevant to us, the proof was given by Bezrukovnikov and Okunkov um, using um, quantization in characteristic P. Um, while rigorous mathematical proof is very difficult, one can understand why one expects this to be true physically as follows. It's important to understand it, oops, because uh, it's important to, whoops, understand it, because um, it will give us an insight of why it is uh, that this construction um, gives manifest categorification. So, braid group action um, is realized physically in the sigma model, um, in the sigma model in the cigar, by letting uh, modular of the theory vary according to the braid in the neighborhood of the boundary at infinity of the cigar. So we have an infinitely long cigar that gives you a conformal block in the first place. Um, the cigar is Euclidean, and the direction along the cigar coincides with time along the braid. You can cut this infinite cigar very near the boundary and insert a complete set of brains to extract matrix elements. Um, this is familiar from, um, this exercise is familiar in quantum mechanics. Um, here we just do it one dimension up. Thus, in the sigma model on the annulus, uh, with moduli that vary according to the braid, uh, the matrix element of the monodromy between a pair of brains um, um, is, is, the sigma model on the annulus computes this monodromy matrix element. And for this, you want to think of time as running along the cigar. Taking the same annulus, uh, but instead viewing the time to run around the circle, computes a supertrace, uh, which is the Euler characteristic of the supercharge preserved by the two brains. The cohomology of that supercharge is the basic ingredient in the category of brains, a graded vec vector space, um, the space of morphisms between a pair of brains homes between the brains. Now here, um, in the second viewpoint, um, we took uh, all the variation between the, of the moduli to happen near one of the two boundaries. You can do that without changing the answer. Um, however, um, um, you let it all happen near one of the two boundaries at the price of changing a boundary condition. The this change in the boundary condition is by a functor associated to the braid. That functor is an equivalence of categories because the category of B-type brains turns out to be independent of A-type moduli being varied. So by viewing the same Euclidean annulus in two different ways, we learn that braid group action on the category of brains manifestly categorifies the monodromy matrix of the KZ equation. Moreover, for any pair of brains, we get a graded vector space, the space of morphisms between the brains, whose Euler characteristic is the braiding matrix element itself. Manifest categorification of those. Um, now, quantum link invariants should also be categorified by the category of B-type brains uh, on the monopole moduli space because 
they can also be expressed as matrix elements of the braiding matrix, just some very special matrix elements. Um, now for this, we have to find objects or brains uh, that, um, that lead to these very special matrix elements. Um, in turn, to be able to do that, you need to understand in, uh, geometric interpretation of fusion in terms of the category of um, B brains on the monopole moduli space. Now, as you bring uh, a pair of singular monopoles close together, um, are corresponding to two strands of a braid coming together, uh, our manifold develops a singularity where a collection of cycles vanishes as the distance uh, between the monopoles controls the size of these cycles. The singularities that occur, occur due to monopole bubbling. When a pair of singular monopoles come together, a number of smooth monopoles can um, bubble off and disappear to leave behind a singular monopole of lower charge. This is well known from applications of this monopole moduli space for geometric Langlands. Um, in conformal field theory, a well-known fact is that fusion diagonalizes braiding. Now, you don't get uh, such diagonalization in the category of brains. It turns out the closest best thing is um, what's called a perverse filtration. Uh, such perverse filtrations were envisioned by uh, Rokwe and Chuang uh, in very abstract terms as the right structure to get, give you simple understanding of the action of braiding on derived categories. The same way, if you understand how to diagonalize braiding on conformal blocks, you get a simple understanding of it. Everything is an eigenvector. So from this, you learn that the caps and the caps come from brains that have a simple geometric meaning. They're not some abstract objects of the derived category. They're simply brains supported in vanishing cycles, known as um, the cycles themselves are very special. They're known as minuscule Grassmannians. Because it turns out you can do the story that I'm telling you only if the representations are special kind of representations, which are called minuscule. Only then is our manifold smooth. So it turns out that using very special properties of perverse filtration and these vanishing cycle brains, it's not difficult to prove that not only do homology groups manifestly categorify corresponding uh, quantum group invariants, uh, quantum link invariants, which you get for free. What you don't get for free is that these groups are themselves link invariants. The reason these proofs are not difficult is that you have this perverse filtration. Um, otherwise, it will be very, very difficult. So recently, Ben Webster proved that homological link invariants that come from B-type brains on these monopole moduli spaces are equivalent to algebraic invariants he de defined in 2013 using an algebra, or more precisely a version of it, uh, known as the KLR double algebra after Kovanov, Lauda, Roquier, and himself. Now, this makes use of works of Bezrukovnikov and Kaledin, uh, which explain how to relate algebras, uh, like this Carroll double algebra, to um, B brains, categories of B brains on geometries like X. Uh, but um, this requires uh, quantization in characteristic P. Now, as stated, neither the approach by um, B-type brains on monopole moduli spaces, nor uh, KLRW algebras is very explicit. In fact, neither is amenable to any calculation at all. Um, in the rest of the talk, I'll explain how to reformulate the problem and get a simple and explicit solution of the problem. And this resulting description is new. So to solve the problem, we'll make use of homological mirror symmetry, or more precisely, of an equivariant version of it. Homological mirror symmetry is, as we said, it's an equivalence of a pair of categories, the category of B-type brains supported, supported on complex submanifolds of X, and the category of A brains supported on real or Lagrangian submanifolds of Y. In the very best instances, one learns how to make homological mirror symmetry manifest, and then both theories based on X and on Y are solvable exactly. One of the very simplest examples of homological mirror symmetry is when our x and y are taken to be simply a pair of infinite cylinders. Uh, the torus fibers here are simply a single circle, and the common base is a single real line. The categories of brains on the two sides turn out to be each generated by a single brain. On x, you take a space-filling brain. On y, you take a brain that looks like a, a single real line along the cylinder. Now, while the brains look different, their algebras of open strings turn out to be the same. Um, the algebra of open strings 
simply turns out to be algebra of functions on a complex cylinder. <clears throat> that is um, completely obvious on the side of x, and um, uh, on the side of y, you can also um, show it using Rafka categories, as this picture suggests. So um, the fact that algebras of open strings on both sides are the same and equal to um, algebra A turns out to mean that the entire the, uh, category of brains, um, that both categories of brains are equivalent because they're both equivalent to um, derived category whose objects are complexes of representations of this algebra A. <clears throat> the simple example is model for how one hopes to understand homological mirror symmetry in all cases. Webster's proof of um, equivalence of categorification uh, quantum link invariance via beta brains on X and via KLRW algebra is really the first of the two equivalences um, in um, homological mirror symmetry, uh, relating X and its category of brains on X and its mirror Y. Now, we are after a simpler and more direct approach to homological link invariance. So we will not try to describe the mirror category or to try or aim try to complete the other half of homological mirror symmetry. Um, recall that X is a moduli space of monopoles on R3, where um, the symmetry that corresponds to rotations plays a key role. That's how we got Q into the problem. This means that uh, all the information about the geometry of our X is contained in, um, uh, in, a, in a subspace of half the dimension. The subspace where all the monopoles, whether they're singular or not, are the origin of one complex plane and points on a longer real line. So we'll call the original space uh, the big X and the half-dimensional subspace that has all the information about this geometry, the small x. So we'll define the equivariant mirror of the big X and call it the small y to be the ordinary mirror of the small x. Now, I wish I could effectively point, <laughs> but it doesn't really work. Um, so the key fact is uh, that the bottom row has as much information about the geometry as the top. It's just much more efficiently packed. The common base of torus vibrations of, of the small x and the small y is parameterized by, by positions of smooth monopoles on a, on a single real line in presence of some singular monopole. So we, I draw here the smooth monopoles as dots as, and the singular monopoles as diamonds. Anyway, uh, the smooth monopoles are colored by simple roots of the Lie algebra and otherwise identical. The equivariant mirror, the small y, um, is, turns out to be a cousin of a configuration space of points on the cylinder. In particular, I can see that um, the cylinder, which is our Riemann surface with punctures. Um, the points are colored by simple roots of the Lie algebra and otherwise indistinguishable. In particular, it's not difficult to see that the SYZ base of this Y um, is the same as the configuration space of um, points, um, colored points on a real line. There's a potential on Y which makes the mirror theory into a lambda Gisbert model, and this potential turns out to be a multi-valued holomorphic function. You may not like multivalued holomorphic functions, but it turns out multivalueness is, is crucial to the story. So corresponding to a solution of a KZ equation is an A brain at the boundary of the long cigar infinity by mir mirroring what we had before. That a brain is an object of the category of A brains, which is in this context is called the derived Foucaultian category on Y because we've added a potential. The mirror description, in particular, leads to integral formulation of conformal blocks as period integrals, uh, which explains, if you like, um, in retrospect, the works of Fagin and Frankel from the 80s and also Schechtman and Bartikov that gave such integral formulas for conformal blocks of their finally algebra. Um, one can describe this category very explicitly, uh, precisely thanks to the fact that um, Y is a simply a configuration space of colored points on a punctured Riemann surface or something very close to it. The objects of this category um, of A brains are simply um, products of one dimensional curves on the Riemann surface colored by simple roots. In any category of A brains, um, a spaces of morphism between a pair of brains 
are defined by floor theory, which is modeled up the most theory approach to supersymmetric quantum mechanics. The role of Morse complex from the beginning of the talk is taken here by the floor complex, which is a vector space spanned by intersection points of the two Lagrangians, graded by the fermion number. And here, in addition by um, Q degrees, thanks to the fact that uh, W is multivalued. The action of the differential in the space um, of perturbative supersymmetric ground states is, as always, generated by instantons. In floor theory, um, a coefficient um, of a given into, uh, of um, the action of the differential is obtained by counting holomorphic disk instantons in Y, interpolating from one intersection point to another of fermion number one and Q degree zero. The cohomology of the resulting complex is a space of morphism between the pair of brains. Now, a vast simplification in the present case is that just as brains have a description in terms of the Riemann surface, so do their intersection points, as well as the maps between them. Uh, what one ends up with um, is um, a generalization to arbitrary simply laced Lie algebra of Hegar floor theory. Hegar floor theory is associated with GL1 slash 1 and categorifies Alexander polynomial. You should think of Hegar floor theory as a theory of fermions on a Riemann surface. And for general, simply laced Lie algebra, you get a theory of onions. Um, that essentially explains all the differences. So the Hegar floor theory is famously solvable and phrased in, exa phrased in exactly same one-dimensional terms. Now, mirror symmetry helps us understand we got a big simplification by working downstairs instead of upstairs. Um, however, we solve the, um, we have a solution to the non categorification problem upstairs. And to understand how to solve it downstairs, we need equivariant mirror symmetry. It helps us know which questions to ask downstairs. Equivariant homological mirror symmetry isn't an equivalence of categories. It can't be because the dimensions of the manifolds are different, and homological mirror symmetry has tons of information about the manifold. So instead, what it is, is a correspondence between brains and uh, associated vector spaces that come from what's called a pair of adjoint functors. What this means is that, uh, well, so firstly, because uh, all the information about the geometry is, con is contained downstairs, um, in, in, in the um, downstairs, every B-type brain on the big X that's relevant to us comes from an A-type brain downstairs on the small Y, Y the functor that sends it up. Um, the functor, essentially, one way of constructing it is by mapping the brain to its mirror downstairs and then um, interpreting it as the brain upstairs. Anyway, a jointness um, implies that given any pair of brains upstairs on the big X that come from downstairs on the small y, the homes between them computed upstairs agree with the homes downstairs. As long as you play the following game, well, one of the brains will take it up and send it back down. Okay. That corrects for the fact that you're working in a space half the dimension. You... For any simply laced Lie algebra, um, um, brains which serve as caps and caps upstairs on the big X um, uh, turn out to um, originate from vanishing cycle brains uh, of the downstairs theory that look like um, generalized intervals. And the functor that sends them down sends them down to generalized figure eights, brains that look like that. In this description, based on the downstairs theory, both Lagrangians and the action of braiding are geometric. So you can simply start with a projection of a link to your surface. To translate it to a pair of A brains, uh, you choose a bicoloring of every link component by an equal number of segments of each color, so that red always underpasses the blue. Then uh, you get the mirror Lagrangians from this bicoloring by replacing, say, all the red segments by interval type brains and all the blue segments by figure eights. Here, the picture is for SU2. It's an obvious generalization for others. The homological link invariant is a space of morphisms between um, the pair of brains, graded by the fermion number and the cube rating. To evaluate the Euler characteristic, uh, you simply count the intersection points of Lagrangians, keeping track of grading. The fact that for SU2, um, the graded count of intersection points computes the Jones polynomial is, in fact, a theorem um, by Bigelow from the 90s. 
was a very strange way of computing the, uh, the Jones polynomial. But uh, now well, you understand why it uh, made sense. Uh, the dimensions of the complex of vector spaces, um, they come from intersection points, and whose cohomology is the link homology, in this case turns out to be to grow polynomially in the number of crossings, which should be compared to exponential growth in Kovanov's case. So uh, for categorification, we'll use much smaller complexes. As in Hegart floor theory, um, co uh, computing the action of the differential can be translated to a sequence of hard but um, well-defined problems in complex analysis in one dimension. You don't have to count maps to a large dimensional space Y. You can simply uh, translate the problem to um, a sequence of rem applications of Riemannian mapping theorem on the Riemann surface. Now, surprisingly, this problem can be solved. You solve all of this counting problems at once by making homological mirror symmetry um, of the downstairs theorem manifest. The fact that um, mirror symmetry can sum up curve counts is its basic property. Here, you sum up curve counts by understanding um, um, mirror symmetry like this. As in simplex examples of, mirror, of homological mirror symmetry, the categories on the two sides turn out to be generated by a finite number of brains. From perspective of Y, the generating set are products of real line Lagrangians colored by simple roots. This is a simple generalization of a very simplest example of mirror symmetry for the cylinder. Associated, um, the associated downstairs algebra of open strings is computable explicitly. Uh, while general, uh, beca beca uh, it, it turns out to require counting very few curves, all of which are elementary to count. Anyway, and it turns out to be a far smaller cousin of the upstairs KLRW algebra, a much simpler algebra. Um, the algebraic description of link homology based on this small algebra has a simple geometric meaning. By the virtue of equivalence of the category of A brains with the category of representations of this derived category of representations of this algebra A, um, any brain um, in, uh, on Y, uh, and in particular, the braided cap brains have a description as a complex uh, of uh, build out of this generating set of brains, where the map in this complex are the gluing prescriptions. It's a prescription for how to get um, the brain by taking connected sums. Um, this complex describing the braided figure eight brains um, turns out to deliver link homology um, of uh, links obtained by capping the braid without any further work, and thereby encoding all the necessary discounts. So it follows that for any simple as Lie algebra, the link homology is, in a very precise sense, a simple known piece of the complex that describes the brain um, in terms of the generating set. Okay, so that's all I want to tell you. <laughs>